Is this thing on? Okay guys, I'm uh, Scott McDonald from Honeywell and uh, my job with Honeywell is to look after basically the products that you buy through a distributor. So I look after all of the commercial distributors in Ontario. So I'm going to be talking about um, economizers and then I'm going to talk about this new commercial residential communicating thermostat that, uh, that we can uh, play around with a bit too. Okay, economizer's ready. Here we go. So economizer is dampers, actuators, and controls that let you use outdoor air for free cooling without bringing on mechanical stages. And it's basically made up of three components. So you've got a logic module, which might be something like this, or something like this. And you've got sensors, which could be something like this enthalpy sensor, or the new um, jade sensor, something like that. Sensors, the, the logic module is the brains of the system. The sensors determine what's going on out there. And then you would have an actuator, like maybe this guy, that basically changes position based on whatever this thing tells it to do. Uh, so on a typical economizer, you've got a rooftop unit, fresh air intake, outdoor air dampers, return air dampers. You've got this actuator and logic module combination outdoor air sensors, mixed air sensor, maybe another return air sensor, so for, it's called dual enthalpy, it's looking at the enthalpy outside and the enthalpy in the return air is, uh, is what that is. You can actually get some pretty good savings with dual enthalpy in this, this climate. Um, you want to use an economizer for three good reasons, saves money immediately, saves money long term, and by reducing the compressor runtime, and then there's this comfort factor of bringing fresh air to the building. The, the economizer really is the best way to bring fresh air to a building to, to allow it to meet the uh, indoor air quality standards. So there's three good reasons why you want to use an economizer. Okay, so really basics of how it works. You've got a thermostat, you've got an economizer logic module, an actuator, and a rooftop unit. So on a call for cooling, Y1 goes through the logic module, and if there's no free cooling available, say it's a single stage unit, just brings it on. If there is free cooling available, that Y1 will basically energize the damper actuator circuit, and the damper actuator is gonna modulate open Second stage of cooling calls, it's going to bring on first stage of mechanical cooling. So you can have economizer and mechanical cooling uh, working at the same time. So on a single stage uh, rooftop unit, you want a two stage thermostat if you have. You have a really good example of that of a, of a golf course in Gravenhurst, where the guy installed uh, a number of five ton rooftop units, which were single stage with economizers and basically residential thermostats uh, controlling them. And it worked okay until a day like maybe today where you have a tournament and the, the golf club fills up at four o'clock with you know 75 guys all at once and the load, the heat load goes pretty high. There's free cooling available, there's economizer available, but it's not enough capacity to cool it, but the mechanical is locked out because it's a single stage thermostat. So the guy, had a, the guy actually, was a, it was a real problem for the guy because he didn't have enough wires to make it a two stage system. And that was before the, you know, we came out with these, you know, two or three wire thermostats or wireless stats. So we had to actually run new, new thermostat wire to fix the problem. So uh, short answer is, yeah, always go with a two stage stat whenever you're using an economizer. So if there is uh, no free cooling available, then it just looks something like that. Both stages call if it's a two-stage unit. Um, talk about 
just quickly about some of the components. So the C7150, I don't have one here. You guys have probably all seen it. It's basically just a thermistor that senses mixed air temperature. Um, and this guy is actually in, in a standard system like this W7459 system. It's actually the signal from that thermistor that's actually driving the motor. So the, that, that signal is actually positioning the actuator. Um, the other thing is the C7400 um, enthalpy sensor. This is actually an older one. The newer ones sort of look more like this. Now we've we've changed the uh, we've changed the uh, the casing on them. But there's there's literally millions of these out in the field. These these enthalpy sensors. And we'll talk a little about troubleshooting in a second. Uh, two different types of motors you're going to run into, the M7415, so that's the one on the table there. There's basically two different versions of it, the A and the B, and basically it just the difference is the way it rotates or spring returns. So we, we sell about probably 80% A models, but there are some B models out there, so if you're, if you're going to a distributor to, uh, to replace one, you just want to make sure you know whether you've got the A or the B. And again, the motor position for this type of system is uh, set by that mixed air sensor directly is what's driving the position. The, uh, the other one looks very similar to that. So we, we call them both black motors, but it takes a two to 10 volt signal from the enhanced version of this W7459. So that would look like, uh, this is the W7459 and it's gonna drive that M7415 black motor. Typically, you find it mounted right on the right on the uh, actuator itself. Uh, sometimes they mount it externally. And um, you guys ever see one of these in the field where you've you know you've got these little potentiometers? You ever see one that goes all the way around? Probably turn it all the way. So it's broken at that point. It doesn't work. So it needs. To, if you see one that spins all the way around, and I've I've actually. Um, you know, seen a guy actually do it. Doesn't take much to bust it internally. It's very, uh, fairly fragile, so you want to watch out for that. I talked a little bit about this guy, and it's the enhanced economizer. And you see them now. Um, like I said, York I know uses uses these guys, and instead of using a thermistor to drive the motor, it's basically being driven by a circuit inside that's putting out. A, um, a 2 to 10 volt signal and uh, it also gives you the ability to control exhaust fans so as the outdoor air opens to a certain point that you can set uh, you can bring on an exhaust fan and we added an occupancy input so you can tie it into your commercial stat you don't need to bring fresh air into a building when it's unoccupied so on the weekends if the building is unoccupied you don't need to bring fresh air in so tying your economizer to this occupancy input on this economizer is a pretty good thing to do. You don't need to bring fresh air in when it's not uh, when it's not needed. Now, if you, if you guys, you know, you've seen one, you've seen these in the field. Have you guys seen that one out there? They did, did you see it with a CO2 sensor on it? No. Because that's, that's a really good, if you ever see one, it's a really good upgrade to demand ventilation. So a, a CO2 sensor, like this is a wall mount CO2 sensor, and we make uh, duct mount versions of this too. You can tie it into this, uh, this module and get demand ventilation. And I actually have a couple of slides on demand ventilation. Basically what that does is it ventilates according to the number of people in the space. Okay, so for example, um, this room has a number of people in it now. Probably most of the time it doesn't. When, when people come into the room, the carbon dioxide level goes up, and then you can ventilate based on the actual occupancy rather than um, just the assumption that the room is going to be occupied. So is that controller, you set the amount of parts per million onto that controller through yeah. that? Yeah, you can uh, do that if, uh, I, I, because it's a, small group here, I'll just jump in on what they're doing in the space. You need to provide anywhere between 0 and 20 CFM per person in the space. And 
You also have to ventilate for the building. So that's what, um, say things like the carpeting in this building, um, if you had some type of lab in the building, um, you may have to have more or less ventilation just to get rid of the, the components from the building. So depending on how many people and what they're doing and the size of the, uh, the building and what's going on in the building, you can determine how much ventilation you need. So if you look at, uh, look at the maximum number of occupants for ventilation and um, the building area gives you your required ventilation. So an example would be something like this. You have 5,000 square foot office with 40 employees in it and one rooftop unit, let's say, just to make it easy with 5,000 CFM capacity. Uh, based on that chart, because people are working in an office, they need five CFM per person. So they need, the building needs 200 CFM for, for the people. And they need, because it's an office, they need 0 0.06 CFM per square foot. So that's 300 CFM. So the total fresh air requirement is 500 CFM which is, it, in the case of this, it's 10%, like you guys said. But it might be different depending on what's going on in, in the building. Might be, they might require more than that, or they might require less than that. So, you know, that's, that's basically how it's, uh, it's, it's determined. And demand ventilation, something like this. So. Uh, with a traditional economizer, like a W7459, you basically set up a minimum position, which is somewhere between um, closed and 100% open. So there's this, this minimum position that the damper is always going to be in. Uh, with demand ventilation, so either with um, that controller or the new one, there's basically three settings. There's the demand control ventilation set point, and that's where you set uh, your, your uh, parts per million. So you might set it at 800 parts per million of CO2. That's what you're gonna try to maintain in the space is 800. Okay. So that's your demand control ventilation set point. Then you have a maximum ventilation, maximum position. And that basically replaces your minimum position. And then you've got a ventilation minimum position so the damper won't necessarily close because you always have to have a little bit of fresh air going into the space for the building components or the off gassing of the carpets and all that it becomes your minimum position and and as space co2 level rises above this set point the damper will start to modulate open. So as the CO2 level goes up, the space fills up with people. CO2 comes in. The damper is going to start to modulate open until it hits this vent maximum position here. Okay, so, so what happens then? You get savings are basically in here by not having to bring all this fresh air in because it's not required. There's, there's a good savings potential with demand ventilation. So um, newer economizers like this one uh, give you the opportunity to pretty easily go in and, and, and install demand ventilation. And there's probably going to be incentives for demand ventilation coming uh, within the next couple of months from probably Enbridge and some of those utilities. They're looking at demand ventilation as being a good way of you know, reducing energy consumption. So that stuff is all coming. So let's, um, I uh, jumped ahead. Uh, just to talk, if you guys want to talk about the, uh, the W7459 or this, this guy, and basically how it functions internally. I have this presentation here. It does a pretty good job of it. So say you've got a uh, two-stage thermostat. You've got Y1, Y2, you've got fan, and you've got 
car terminal and you have your equipment so you have basically the same thing and you have two stages of cooling and a fan you got a transformer and you wire it up so that uh, R goes to R let's say internally the stat closes R to G and brings the fan on or goes closes Y1 brings the first stage of cooling on brings the second stage on so that's basically how it how it works we have an economizer so we have the M7415 so we have the we have the actuator and then we have the uh, the economizer here, and that's basically in the layout of how it uh, how it works internally. W seventy four fifty nine. You have your enthalpy sensor, your mixed air sensor, and then now you need to wire the now you need to wire the the economizer in. So if it looks something like this. You bring power to the system to terminal T R and then out of TR1 to common. Basically that completes a circuit like that, which powers the actuator. So uh, you want to put power on TR and TR1 on the actuator will actually power it. Powering T1 and P1 internally, which powers the minimum position circuit. So that's where you've got this little pot here for minimum position is powered internally through there. So that gives you a minimum position. So it'll power the actuator, give you a minimum position. And then uh, it'll power the first leg of the, of the mixed air circuit. As you can see right here, there's a switch. There's a switch which is not preventing the mixed air uh, circuit from coming, coming in. So then you wire up the cooling to it. So assuming no free cooling available, Y1 from the equipment goes to terminal two on the economizer. The stat calls for cooling and internally, no, there's no free cooling available. That call for cooling goes in one and comes out two and brings on the uh, first stage of cooling. You got to wire the second stage, so that goes into three and out of four. It looks something like that. Second stage of cooling is brought in, into the circuit. And you need to finish it by uh, Y1 into terminal five. And then you'll see why we did that in a second. So, say free cooling is available. Internally, you can see this switch goes to that position. Yeah. yeah. So thermostat calls for cooling. What it does is it powers up that coil, 1S coil. It's basically a little, little internal coil, which in turn closes that contact, which in turn mixed air sensor is brought into the circuit. So that's where that mixed air sensor now is going to be controlling the actuator directly now. So the mixed air sensor is going to be controlling the cooling and it's set for about 55 degrees. That's what it's trying to maintain. Second stage cooling calls and the call gets routed basically through to terminal five which then brings on the first stage cooling. So you have the mixed air sensor and cooling one energized at that point. Everybody got that? If you want, if you want, I know Tom, uh, you have a copy of this. This is your computer actually, it's on yours. So if you want to email it to these guys, they can uh, they can have that uh, as a reference or maybe you want to do right on the YouTube video, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, just some troubleshooting stuff, and this is really, it's right out of the, um, the spec sheet for the W7459. Um, so basically, uh, troubleshooting, first check the motor. So power at TR and T1. 
TR1 um, and jumper T to T1 which bypasses the mixed air sensor should drive the motor open. So if you ever want to test a motor, put power to it, jumper T and T1, motor should drive open. Uh, to actually troubleshoot the system itself, um, there's, there's a, a fairly detailed um, procedure in the, in, the, in the manual, and it looks something like this. It says basically disconnect the cooling stages from the economizer, disconnect the power, and disconnect the jumper from P and P1. So that's uh, this little jumper right down here on P and P1 and then jumper TR to 1 and T1 to T. So you're basically jumpering the mixed air sensor. Disconnect the enthalpy sensor, put power back to it and you're completing the following circuit which should energize the motor. Um, motor should stay closed if there's a high resistance on this SR and SR1 up here. If you re that's, that's because of this resistor that's on here. If you remove the resistor, simulates low enthalpy, the motor should drive open. So that's basically how you can, you can fool this thing into thinking um, there's either high or low enthalpy. So the motor should drive open at that point. You reconnect the resistor. Here's where you use the um, 1.2 kilo ohm checkout resistor, which you can make by using two of these resistors. Um, basically, when you put that on, if you have the enthalpy set point at A, the motor should drive open. If you have it at D, if you move it over to D, the motor should drive closed. So that's the other way to, uh, to check it out. And finally, checking sensor operation. If you want to check the enthalpy sensor, you can reconnect the plus lead of the enthalpy sensor and your milliamp reading should be between 3 to 25 milliamps depending on the, uh, the output, uh, sorry, the, uh, the relative humidity. So you just look it up based on relative humidity and temperature and you should get a milliamp reading there. So that's going to tell you whether your enthalpy sensor is working or not. And then you've got to check the mixed air sensor. It's basically check the resistance of it. Um, temperature versus resistance chart in here. We'll test that sensor. So that, that's basically the procedure for troubleshooting W7459.